Welcome to World Med School. My name is Edward Nardell. I'm a, an associate prof professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And in this micro lecture, I'm going to talk about tuberculosis infection control with a specific emphasis on multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Here you see traditional tuberculosis infection control. And in particular, I'm going to be focusing on the three main hierarchies of TB infection control, administrative controls, environmental and engineering controls, and respiratory protection, shown on the left. Where are MDR-TB patients treated? Mostly they're treated in hospital, but patients are also treated in some centers in clinics and sometimes in the community. Partners in Health, an organization that I also work with, has long advocated treating MDR-TB patients in the community. Also, key administrative control is how quickly are MDR-TB patients diagnosed and placed on effective treatment, underlying effective. Globally, there are an estimated 500,000 new MDR-TB cases per year. Most are treated in hospitals, and unsurprisingly, more than half of MDR-TB cases are believed to result from transmission, probably many of them in hospitals. The different modes or places where MDR-TB can be treated have different implications for TB transmission control. Again, there are three models. Hospitalization is widely practiced in Russia, Belarus, Georgia, really almost all the former Soviet Union countries. And in addition, South Africa has traditionally uh, used hospitalization, although that's changing. Non-hospitalization can be divided into clinics, clinic-based, and community-based. Examples of clinic-based are Nepal, but there are many others. And I would make a distinction that Clinics are professionally staffed. Community-based treatment programs are found in Peru, Cambodia, Lesotho, and the Philippines. And the key component there, although nurses and doctors are, of course, involved, is the um, presence of low-paid or, in some cases, volunteer community workers. At Partners in Health, we strongly feel that, patient, that community workers need to be paid. There are several arguments that can be made for community-based MDRTB treatment. The first one is the growing shortage of bed availability for treating MDRTB in hospital. The second is the cost effectiveness of community-based versus hospital care. And the third is lower transmission risk with community-based treatment, both to staff and to other patients. This is a, a bit of data from South Africa uh, 2010, showing in 2008 the deficit in hospital beds available in the Republic of South Africa in all of its states, comparing the registered patients in 2008 and the beds that were available. Although this situation has improved, it is largely because of a shift in South Africa to community-based treatment. The second argument is cost effectiveness. Here we show the data from a, a system, systematic review of cost and cost effectiveness for the treatment of multidrug resistant tuberculosis by Fitzpatrick and Floyd, published in Pharmaeconomics 2012. Here you see above the yellow line two hospital based programs in Tomsk, Russian Federation, and Estonia former Soviet Union, and you see the cost per patient as 11, essentially 11 to $15,000 each, and the cost per DALI, uh, which somewhat adjusts the cost per the for each e economic situation, as still being relatively high compared to below the yellow line for the Philippines, which uses a community-based approach, and Peru, which uses a community-based approach, and both of those are in the 
2.4 to 3.6 thousand dollar range and much much cheaper in terms of cost per dally as well. Here is a familiar setting and paper of the transmission of XDRTB reported in Lancet in 2006 whereby a series of 53 XDR patients were discovered in one hospital and two-thirds of them of these patients um, had been hospitalized, all had had co- co-infection with HIV, and the uh, 55% of them had had no previous treatment. So that indicates that they were reinfected with this characteristic KZN strain indicating hospital transmission. So one of the dangers of treating MDRTB in hospital is the um, potential for transmission. In the late 50s, early 60s, Richard Riley um, developed a remarkable model for studying TB transmission whereby patients were hospitalized and the air from the hospital beds, from those hospital rooms, were conducted to the penthouse of the hospital where hundreds of guinea pigs um, were housed. Uh, Guinea pigs are highly susceptible to tuberculosis, and this facility became a quantitative air sampling uh, situation for uh, tuberculosis. We've recreated a similar facility in Mpumalanga province, Republic of South Africa, also with six patient beds and adjacent guinea pig exposure facilities shown in this slide. The first thing we tested was one of the environmental controls against tuberculosis, and here are shown three different models of upper room germicidal UV lamps. The purpose of these lamps is to kill organisms in the air, and you can see from the time-lapse photograph that these fixtures generate a relatively narrow band of UV in the upper room, which with good air mixing allows uh, air disinfection to occur in the lower room. We wanted to test the efficacy of these fixtures. To do that, we used our facility in this way. On the bottom of the slide, are shown six patient rooms and you see the air going to the ductwork to two different uh, guinea pig exposure chambers. On the days, every other day, when the ultraviolet fixtures were turned on, the air went to guinea pig chamber A, and in the opposite days, the alternative days, when the UV was off, the air went to guinea pig exposure chamber B. At the end of several months, with patients continually occupying the ward, the difference of infection rate between the two guinea pig colonies was a direct reflection of how infectious the uh, patients were and the effectiveness of the intervention. So, quiz, how effective is upper room germicidal ultraviolet irradiation? 20%, 50%, or 80%. Give you a second to think about that. We found that upper room germicidal irradiation was 80% effective. This following slide shows the setup. Uh, On this panel to the left, you see the air entering uh, in the breathing zone uh, that's going to be conducted to the guinea pigs. You see the upper room germicidal fixture, and also important, a paddle fan for good air mixing. Here's the actual data showing the numbers of guinea pigs infected under the control situation in two different studies. In one study, nine guinea pigs were infected under control conditions. In the other, 48 guinea pigs were infected under control conditions. However, when the UV lights were on, on those days, many fewer guinea pigs were infected resulting in a hazard ratio of 4.9 or an efficacy of about 80%. These data, together with similar data from Peru, Escambi showed 72% efficacy, provide strong evidence that a properly applied upper room germicidal UV can be highly effective in preventing transmission in real-world setting. And future studies will better define these conditions um, 
so that, that this data can be uh, reproduced. There are many implementation barriers. Uh, we need low-cost fixtures that are well made. Um, we need uh, good guidelines um, for using this uh, modality uh, throughout the world. So we did the same kind of study with surgical masks on patients. Uh, we asked them to wear the masks every other day. On the day they were wearing the masks, the air went to one guinea pig colony. On the days they were not wearing the mask, it went to another guinea pig colony. And here are the uh, potential results. Were the masks 20% effective, 50% effective, or 80% effective? The surgical masks were 50% effective. And here you see pictures of, of, of a healthcare worker wearing a surgical mask on the left, which is intended for patients in the case of tuberculosis, as opposed to a respirator, same person wearing the green uh, respirator, which fits tighter and is intended for healthcare worker protection. But for patients, a surgical mask is what's recommended. Uh, and here's the actual data. Uh, at the end of uh, four months, we had 36 infections when people were wearing masks and when they were uh, not wearing masks, there were 69%, 69 guinea pigs infected, 53% effectiveness. How effective are room air filtration machines? Our study, and I'm not going to show you this data in detail, uh, found that they were relatively ineffective. And so, generally speaking, we don't recommend any of the filtration machines you'll see out there. They tend to be very undersized for the rooms that they're used in. Um, this is not an effective mode of air disinfection. Finally, when do MDR-TB patients become non-infectious, less than 24 hours, two weeks, or until smear culture is negative? This is a highly c controversial question, and uh, I'll give you a second to think about it, and you'll be surprised to learn that in our studies, it's less than 24 hours using the guinea pig model. Uh, Riley showed the same thing, and his data is showing is shown here. Um, you see susceptible patients started on therapy were almost immediately 98% less infectious, and even drug-resistant patients were significantly less infectious uh, once started on therapy. It's important in the study to realize that patients started on therapy the very day they went into the facility, not two weeks later. So this was a very rapid effect of, of treatment. So the, one of the bottom lines here is that the most important um, consideration is undiagnosed TB and undiagnosed drug resistance. In a general medical ward, it's undiagnosed TB that is the problem. In a TB hospital, it's undiagnosed and un inadequately treated MDR-TB. We've uh, attempted to address this with a program we call FAST, Find TB Cases, through rapid diagnosis, active case finding through cough surveillance. We separate patients temporarily and get them on effective treatment extremely fast. This is all fits under the administrative uh, part of administrative controls, of, of TB infection controls, and uh, is not new. It's just a reprioritization of getting people on diagnosed quickly on effective therapy. In summary, there's not enough hospital beds globally for inpatient treatment. Hospitalization is more expensive and not necessarily and not necessary. UVGI and surgical mask may be effective, but not nearly as effective as administrative controls. Transmission risk in the community, clinic, and hospital can be profoundly reduced by the FAST approach, finding cases actively separate and treat, active case finding followed by DST-directed effective treatment. And that is the end. Thank you.